ladies and gentlemen, as we await the arrival of chief guest and municipal dignitary from administrative announcement, first may I remind everyone to put off their phones or leave it in flight mode as it may cause interference with the audio system. Keeping in mind health and safety, I would also request everyone to continue donning your face mask except while speaking. The program for the day is flashed on screen. It has also been provided to you in the folders. At the end of an orderly session, attendees are requested to remain seated till departure of the chief guest. Finally, a buzzer would be sound as the flag officer commanding in chief enters. All except ladies are requested to rise. Thank you.
वाइस एडमिरल विश्वजीत दास गुप्ता ए वी एस एल वाई एस एल वी एस एल फ्लैग ऑफिसर कमांडिंग इन चीफ ईस्टर्न नेवल कमांड वाइस एडमिरल संदीप नैथानी ए वी एस एल वी एस एल चीफ ऑफ मटीरियल श्री जे डी पाटिल फुल टाइम डायरेक्टर डिफेंस एंड स्मार्ट टेक्नोलॉजीज एल एन टी ए एस डीज ऑफ योर फ्लैग ऑफिसर्स लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ रेयर एडमिरल आई बी उथैया वी एस एल एडमिरल सुपरिंटेंडेंट नेवल डॉक्यार विशाखापटनम It is indeed my honor and privilege to welcome you all to the Golden Jubilee Technical Seminar. As you are aware, Naval Dockyard Visakhapatnam is the premier yard on the eastern seaboard of our country. The yard has been supporting ships and submarines of the Eastern Naval Command, Andaman and Nicobar Command, Indian Coast Guard, and ships of friendly foreign maritime forces. The journey of Naval Dockyard Visakhapatnam commenced during the Second World War. when a handful of small warships were positioned at Visakhapatnam to service these warships a boat repair workshop was established in 1940 under HMIS Sarkas the boat repair workshop evolved into a base repair organization in 1958 under the then INA Sarkas in the late 60s the given number of acquisition of highly sophisticated warships and submarines at the eastern naval command it was inevitable that the bro had to rise to the occasion and develop into a yard capable of providing the requested maintenance and support to this technologically advanced vessels to keep them fighting fit construction of naval dockyard visakhapatnam commenced in 1968 based on a soviet project team report the bro was then upgraded to naval dockyard in 1972 and today it covers an area of 663 acres with a waterfront of about 5 kilometers including 3 and a half kilometers of jetties and berths as we commemorate the 50 golden years of naval dockyard the yard has taken the onerous responsibility of spearheading our navy's efforts in atmanirbharta that is self reliance in refitting our ships and submarines accordingly the theme for today's seminar is atmanirbharta make in india initiatives relevant to indian navy This seminar would progress through three sessions. The first session, sub theme, charting an Atmanirbharta roadmap, would be followed by the sub theme, self reliance in ship building and smart yard initiatives, and conclude with the final session, focusing on the sub theme, leapfrogging on Atmanirbharta for system support. To commence the proceedings, may I request Rear Admiral I B Uthaya, Admiral Superintendent Naval Dock Yard Vishakhapatnam. to please deliver the welcome address vice admiral sujit das gupta flag officer commanding in chief east naval command vice admiral sandeep natani chief of material shri jd patel full time director defense and smart edge technologies lnt india serving and retired asds flag officers officers uh, esteemed guests ladies and gentlemen good morning and a very very warm welcome to each of you creating an institution which stands the test of time involves amongst many others a strategic vision sustained leadership and exemplary work ethics the men and women who man it the naval dockyard visakhapatnam at the cusp of commemorating 50 years in service of the nation has evolved as one such institution providing technical support for technical cutting edge sensors weapons and machinery on our ships and submarines i consider it an absolute privilege to helm this premier dockyard especially through its golden jubilee year over the years the yard has developed vast expertise attaining self reliance in hull repair and to a large extent in the field of weapons engineering and electrical systems managers supervisors and notably the unsung workers have toiled as they continue to do so even today to render unstinted repair and refit support the drive resilience and sense of innovation has remained a consistent thread for the last 5 decades my deepest gratitude also goes out to the admiral superintendents many of who are in our midst today for the vision and contribution 
which has made this yard an institution of eminence with an extraordinary work culture. The clarion call of Atmanirbhar Bharata Abhyan as an umbrella concept is an imperative today as it seeks to make us self-reliant as a nation by encouraging the domestic industry. The complex mix of Eastern and Western origin equipment and the long lead support make mechanisms has however always driven the dockyard to seek niche indigenous sources to meet refit timelines. While I can recount many indigenous developments such as the SNF gearbox clutches, GT intake diaphragms and coolers, RF components of surveillance and fire control radars, rectifier PCB cards, Barak and Garpun submodules and critical in situ repair. The local industry and MSMEs have partnered the yard in each one of these endeavors of ours. My sincere appreciation therefore goes out to all our committed partners who have been our pillars of strength in ensuring combat worthiness of our ships and submarines. The Indian Navy has always sought to create an ecosystem for the industry to be equal partners in building and maintaining our assets. I therefore wish to state here that the Eastern Naval Command and the Naval Dockyard in particular aim to achieve absolute self-reliance in the realm of maintaining our vital assets primarily through indigenous support. Despite the immense challenge of the onset of COVID and the negligible support from foreign OEMs in the interregnum, the industry has risen to the occasion of aiding operational readiness of our assets. It is further the synergy between the yard, its partner industries and MSMEs that the technical seminar and expo today is being held. I'm confident that the papers being presented and the ensuing discussions during the seminar will greatly help the Navy and industry enrich each other with their respective insights. To conclude, I express a sincere gratitude to the Commander and Chief for consenting to be the Chief Guest for the Dockyard's Golden Jubilee Showcase event today. I thank the Chief of Material for gracing the event to deliver the theme address. Our immense gratitude also goes to Sri J.D. Patel for making time to deliver the keynote address. And finally, to all our veteran ASDs, sirs, the yard is inspired by your presence here today. I also thank all our speakers, contributors, and distinguished guests for the encouragement. Wishing the participants a fruitful seminar and expo. Jai Hind, thank you. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, we are privileged to have among us Vice Admiral Sandeep Mathani, Chief of Material. May I request Chief of Material to deliver the theme address. Flag of Sir Commanding in Chief, East Naval Command, ASDs of yore who are present here and have helmed this yard in uh, the last 50 illustrious year, years, Sri J.D. Patel, Director and Senior Executive Vice President, LNT. Uh, I also see CMD MDL and CMD HSL. It's very difficult to make people out in the mask, but I'm trying my best to identify people. Uh, ASD, Naval Dockyard Vizag, Flag Officers, I can see Admiral Bhalla has also joined. Uh, distinguished guests, members of the industry and MSMEs, ladies and gentlemen. A very good morning to all of you. It is indeed a great privilege and honor for me to be here on the occasion of the Golden Jubilee of the Naval Dockyard Vishakapatnam, which is being uh, celebrated through a very relevant seminar on Atmanirbhata, making India initiatives relevant to the Indian Navy. At the outset, I would like to congratulate the Naval Dockyard Vishakapatnam for 50 years of service to the nation. I take this opportunity to felicitate the yard personnel for the commitment, resilience, and innovative spirit to meet the challenges at hand successfully. I happen to be here in Vizag from 1968 to 1974. Though I was in school at the time, I was aware of the construction of this major dockyard, and I'm happy to be here again after 50 years. I would like to congratulate the command and all of you for the Swanim Varsh celebrations to commemorate the exceptional role played by the command in our spectacular victory 50 years ago. 
moving on to today's seminar on Atmanirbhata. Self-reliance through indigenization has been the guiding principle of the Indian Navy since inception. And many in the audience today, both are pioneering veterans and the illustrious members of the private and public enterprises have been part of the journey over the years. The focus of the Indian Navy has always been to evolve as a high-tech and combat ready force. Therefore, it is imperative that we continue to strive towards developing better technologies to make ourselves more self-reliant and superior to our adversaries on land, air, and at sea. It is a matter of pride that with the active participation of the Indian industry, DRDO, and the academia, we have achieved indigenization of equipment and systems in all the three categories, float, move, and fight. I'm not mentioning the percentages, but suffice to say, we have achieved quite a bit. But I'm also aware we have a lot left and need to continue this endeavor in the right earnest. Ladies and gentlemen, it is important to understand that the Navy's role and responsibilities have expanded significantly over the years. This is in response to the changing geoeconomic and geostrategic circumstances necessitating a wide inventory of state-of-art weapons, sensors, and equipment for naval platforms that cater to the needs of India's maritime security. Also, we have seen a technological revolution all around, especially in the digital sphere. Artificial intelligence, augmented reality, virtual reality, reality and data analytics are the new buzzwords. In the commercial world, they have created quite a storm. Drones autonomous cars and even autonomous commercial ships and barges are being operated and may become the norm soon. In April 2016, we have seen the SpaceX rocket shooting into space. And if you have seen the video, it landed precisely on a floating barge. Simply amazing. Disruptive warfare, disruptive warfare is also ushering in a new paradigm where innovation is the key. We are seeing ships boarding parties. You would have seen the video flying in jetpacks for boarding ships instead of the traditional boat. So there is a lot we can do and have to do for making our Navy future ready. I believe we have no time to lose and need to act now and ensure that we have the desired results by the end of the decade. We need to set six monthly targets till 2030 to achieve our goals. As the Chief of Material, I have uh, another 740 days or so. So, Atmanirbhata and induction of state of our technologies would be one of my main focus areas. As we are aware, the government has given a big thrust to make in India in the last seven years. Three days ago, on the 18th of December, the Honorable Raksha Mantri, while speaking on the theme, India Beyond 75, in clear, unambiguous terms, stated that the vision of the government of India was to make India a defense manufacturing hub and grow from a 85,000 crore rupees defense and aerospace market to a 5 lakh crore rupee market by 2047. He had recently met delegations from the US, Russia and France and clearly told the foreign countries that the GOI wishes to manufacture defense equipment in India as national security is the government's topmost priority. The Ministry of Defense has launched numerous schemes which finally aim at reducing imports, promoting self-reliance in defense manufacturing sector and encouraging MSMEs to adopt new technologies. Also, a lot has been done in the last decade to encourage and promote the private industry by removing all undue advantages, perceived or otherwise, that the public sector had in procurement procedures and terms and conditions of the contract. DAP 2020 has now been aligned with the, with the vision to empower Indian domestic industry with the ultimate aim of turning India into a global manufacturing hub. To create an ecosystem for rapid innovation and technological development, a scheme titled Innovation for Defense Excellence, IDEX, was launched in April 18. As on date, a total of 19 problem statements have been taken up for the Navy to 23 startups. Additional problem statements are being collated for taking up during the next cycle of the IDEX startup challenge. 
the Indian Navy has also been the late service to conclude contracts for prototype development under the Make 2 category. The first prototype under this category has already been developed by three MSMEs and the trials are planned shortly. Similarly, the TDF, and this is by the DIO scheme, which is exclusive for MSMEs, has also been leveraged by the Indian Navy and presently 15 projects are being pursued. Out of the 15 projects, contract for prototype development has been concluded for nine, and the balance six projects are in the pipeline for contract conclusion. The Indian Navy is also exploring recent advancements in defense technologies like unmanned vessels, directed energy weapons, smart sensors, multifunction radars, long range guidance systems, composite material, and green energy practices. Also, some of the new technology of interest to in the Indian Navy are quantum technology, inter alia for secure communications, network gigabit ethernet switches, cognitive radars, and radios. Further key projects like automation and robotics in the dockyards, jam resistant high speed data links, compact integrated mass for communications and EW are also being looked at. Indigenous development of high end technology, their translation into defense hardware, induction into the service and standardization is no mean task. And there are bound to be a number of challenges. We are looking for sustainable and reliable equipment for our platforms. Both these words are very, very important. Reliable and sustainable. That is, the indigenous products would, should be of the best quality for reliable operations and should be sustainable and maintainable with the requisite logistic support for the stated life of the equipment. We expect the private sector to play a bigger role to convert these challenges into opportunities to the various schemes of Make in India to meet the needs of the Indian Navy. I would request our industry partners to access the document Swav Lamban. This is available in the open domain to understand the international requirements of the Navy. If you're not able to access it, my staff sir can give you on WhatsApp too. This is available on the net. I would also urge the bigger private industries to utilize the expertise of startups and the resources of MSMEs and have transfer of technologies with foreign partners to usher in innovative and state of art technology to add to their defense products portfolio. To conclude, I would say that the government of India has done its bit and all of us have to work together to seize the opportunity and act boldly and act now to take this agenda of Indianization of reliable and state of art equipment and systems of the Indian, for the Indian Navy forward. I would once again like to assure the audience that the Indian Navy is leaving no stone unturned to ensure that our existing and future platforms have maximum indigenous content with homegrown niche technologies at par with the best available in the world. This noble intent and vision will not only ensure a combat ready and modern Navy, but would also create a robust defense manufacturing ecosystem capable of exporting defense products in the world market. I would like to appeal to all participants of the seminar to discuss the issues threadbare and work out clear agendas that are practical and implementable. Seeing the vast and varied repertoire of knowledge and experience of the participants, I'm sure that the discussions will lead to clear way ahead. Wishing all of you healthy and fruitful deliberations in the seminar. I once again extend my best wishes to Naval Dockyard Vishakhapatnam on the occasion of the Golden Jubilee. Thank you, Jai Hind, Shanu Varuna. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, we now move on to the keynote address of the Golden Jubilee Technical Seminar. For delivering the keynote address, we are indeed delighted to have in our midst, Sri J.D. Patil, Whole Time Director, Defense and Smart Technologies, LNT. May I now invite Sri J.D. Patil to deliver the keynote address. my proud privilege to represent here today amidst the place which made 1971 happen. 
एडमिरल दास गुप्ता एडमिरल नैतानी और एडमिरल उतैया लॉट मेनी फ्रेंड्स इन यूनिफॉर्म वेटरन्स सर्विंग ऑफिसर्स लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन फॉर मी समन हु इज अटैच टू दिस सेगमेंट फॉर लिटिल मोर देन थ्री एंड हाफ डिकेड आई थिंक माई रिकाउंट इज टू सम एक्सटेंट एंड inside in as well as outside in kind of a view when we start looking at uh, indian navy uh, today we obviously see a navy which is very substantially atmanirbhar and this atmanirbhar uh, won't happen unless there is something that the forefathers did amazingly right so if we were to start looking at uh, the 40s when la santigro first got involved with the Uh, navy uh, those days the british navy those days i remember it used to be specific the kind of work packages more related to repairs more related to uh, some kind of a replacement which was more to do with the war stricken vessels that came to bombay of course the independence came and at that point in time uh, we went out of business but that's essentially where the involved only during that period of war what i recount is in 40s we used to actually do degaussing of vessels in 40s we used to do weapon system installations we used to do machinery repairs in 40s now when i start looking back now this is precisely the next two decades that actually kept the industry out and the government truly decided that they would only depend on the government owned sector came navy back in 60s and started saying we will want to do everything here i think the leadership of early 60s to sort of decide that if we are not going to be supported by the british we need to now start making our things ourselves not just a matter of equipment and systems but the complete vessels and then more and more complex vessels followed come 80s we started getting into some very serious equipment development and i remember my relationships with navy those days and uh, you could walk into a professional directory start discussing on what is your problem and what needs to be solved go to a dockyard talk directly with right from people who actually manage the repairs and then start helping them out in terms of what is needed not too many in the industry at that point in time were there but i must say navy found ways to work with industry and this is 20 25 year nearly before the market was opened and private industry was licensed now when you start carving a complete new ways and new processes and new methods you actually have given an example to the rest of the armed forces that the policies are there in place policies never allowed a private sector to do anything in defense but it's indian navy who said in 80s that if there was a foreigner who wanted to sell an equipment someone in uniform will tell him that uh, i don't want to buy it from you i want this equipment but i'll buy it from a local firm and please tie up with a local firm I remember those days there was no fear of the three Cs. The way I see that fear engulfing everybody in the uniform as well as in the ministry, there was no fear. People were absolutely straightforward in terms of uh, absolute professionalism, and I think where Navy has reached in terms of its indigenous level is truly tribute to those tall officers who essentially made those decisions. and it only gets me to think of what einstein had said if you do the same thing the same way follow same processes and same methods you can't get anything new and this is precisely what is a complete sea change in decision making sea change in making things happen in this country right from the fundamental design to system integration complex system getting integrated anywhere in the world you could pick up at will what equipment you wanted and integrated and there was an industry gradually being built 
to be able to support each and every of these initiatives. I think this is precisely what saw Navy emerging into what it is today. Most challenging kind of uh, platforms got developed. All kind of new technologies which started happening in the country. And if I start looking back into those 80s, many of those extremely audacious kind of uh, programs that the Navy took on actually happened over the subsequent years. We have been an organization which like from 60s got associated with the entire strategic sector. But from 80s I can tell you that we started directly doing work with the armed forces in a big way. And the first obviously was Navy and of course the defense research. Dr. Kalam having moved from space to defense actually made all the difference in terms of all future developments in defense actually involving the private sector. Because as a part of the space, it's us who built the first launch vehicle which took the Indian satellite down. Now, as a result, Dr. Kalam always believed that when you move into defense research and the director DRDL that he was those days, with the IGMDP, many things started happening. But if you look at where did the IGMDP programs actually end up with, where did the naval research bodies, whatever labs uh, DRDO had, they all were directly used unconditionally. And I know of days when a weapon system was supposed to be developed, and because it was not ready, Navy built a vessel which never had a weapon for a couple of years. So this was that trust of a uniform into a specific kind of uh, belief that if we want to be completely uh, indigenous and stand on our own feet, there are methods, there are ways that have to be found in terms of what is required to be done with our own research, our own development, our own ways of making. And even if, in a way, it was, let me use a slang, unis bees, or unis chalega, as long as it's local. Because then the life cycle and the subsequent varieties of support that an outpost needs is going to be available locally. So this is where we see a Navy actually getting on. To, to an extent virtually, I can tell you uh, there was targeted uh, kind of uh, uh, matchmaking, let me use that word, between the foreign majors and the Indian companies and Navy's uh, sort of MFME backup truly was one of the largest. I can say that as a watcher of the industry and specifically to the Navy, from few hundred partners that Navy enjoyed, today it's few thousands. And this few hundreds to few thousands obviously speaks volumes in terms of what has been happening in this sector. Dockyards obviously became the nerve center of each and every of those activities and we know uh, today dockyards are not able to do whatever dockyard is set out to do in terms of not the ability of people or the skills, it's sheer size of the Navy that is growing. Now this growth which we see going forward, either we have to have completely different processes or different methods and we see last couple of years that if it's actually being farmed out. Now this is essentially where we see the trust actually building up between the uniform and the industry. That earlier days it used to be subsystems and equipment or let's say for that matter some minor solutions in terms of software to every complete complex kind of an equipment and system coming from within the stable of an Indian industry. Getting integrated, getting complicated, I mean building those complex kind of uh, systems right here and supporting them through the life. We can go on and on on uh, the, the way the Navy has been built. One and one remembers every major milestone in the journey of uh, when we started getting associated right from Project 16 to 16 and past to var varieties of platforms and complex vessels that got built. We have seen that uh, the earnestness in one uniform, which I can tell you now that uh, Lassen Dubro actually works with all the four, the Coast Guard included, 
we don't see that kind of openness in anywhere and everywhere. And that's essentially where the Navy, when called in, gets the best attention from an organization, which we know we spent so many years together. And as a result, you trust each other completely. To my mind, we have achieved a lot. And there's virtually no doubts in terms of uh, what India has achieved. If we start looking at our own comparisons, one of the best of those comparison kind of vessels that anywhere in the world anyone can build, we do them today. In terms of technology, specifically some of the mega projects where we ourselves are uh, involved. Now that we keep on discussing possible defy India with every submarine builder in the world, we know where exactly we stand and we stand ahead of most of the nations with whom we talk today in terms of submarine building technologies. So that's the capacity and capability that together between Navy, the uniform, the skills that essentially are imparted into individuals with the Navy and the industry together can achieve. We truly can do things which are better than anywhere else. Admiral Nathani very rightly talked about uh, the days of mega vessels and large capabilities, of course, some of them needed, but it's going to get getting into more and more of the unmanned war, more and more of that uh, remotely fought kind of situation, and more and more of digital and the space domain will start getting into. At uh, Society of Indian Defense Manufacture, which uh, I just gave my charge to the next uh, president last week, and uh, we always kept saying that when we start looking at the five domains of war, the three armed forces, the cyber, the space, and of course, the sixth then comes the industry. Unless all six are strong, build their own kind of know-how and capabilities. So before a war actually is going to be fought, are the fourth and the fifth and the sixth dimension of today's defense, which essentially will start making a difference. From that perspective, when we start looking from a room completely unlit, you actually can disable an enemy to be able to fight. From the space, you can provide the kind of intelligence and which we obviously need to do much more on these domains than what we obviously have. And of course, getting into the autonomous unmanned kind of situations. And this is where, to me, the future lies. The future lies not just in putting a gun on the uh, ship deck, but the new generation guns. Do we talk of then the particle guns, the laser beams, the electron, uh, 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 electron kind of uh, charge uh, kind of guns? Now this is where the future will essentially take us. And that's essentially where we all need to be spending time. So the thinking of those 70s and 80s, which actually brought us here, we need to get into, in some way, getting into that level of thinking to be able to create these new e e uh, equipment and systems, which are completely going to differentiate us. Today we hear it's only the Americans who talk of laser guns. But laser guns can be created. All it means is a shake hand. This shake hand process, which to me existed when the DPP didn't exist. It was ways of working together which between industry and Navy we found. And of course, as more and more rules and regulations came in and they came in written form, we are actually to some extent put the relationship related kind of working little behind. I think it's time to really revive that and then of course, unleash our potential in terms of doing what we today don't do and much more obviously that we all can achieve together. When I start looking at uh, Naval uh, Dockyard Advice Act, my first visit here was before the Navy bought the first weapon system indigenously. I was told by then Admiral Kalra uh, saying Ki, you go and look at some of the weapon system, we will want a replacement weapon system at that point in time, and I can tell you the year was 1992. 
So 92 onwards, a series of weapon systems that started getting gradually indigenized happened with my first visit to this place. At that point in time, we were looking at replacement of multiple of the LST uh, platform and of course the torpedo launchers and things like that. That's where the journey began in terms of indigenous weapons. Of course, the weapon per se, we didn't really make, and of course that's not, not what a mandate doesn't to put on to itself. But on the equipment and systems, with DRDO's partnership, so many of them happened. We need to find those partnerships today between Navy, DRDO, and uh, the industry, which truly can create unthinkable capability right here. And that's essentially which will position us with the adversaries, the way we start looking at them very differently. We are held to my mind, Raksha Mantri has very rightly talked about some of those things that the India would want to do in comes up, uh, coming times. Let me say, one can always keep talking of numbers in future, they're big numbers. And Admiral Nathan has very rightly captured that 85,000 to 5 lakh crores of per year defense industry in next 25 years. The shorter term target, which we see very clearly by 2025, export more than we import. And that's typically something which we see certainly and eminently possible. What we have seen is the ability of the MSMEs, the startups, the large industries who could sort of put them together is making some of those kind of visions happen. Nobody trusted in 2016 when there was no export truly worth its name happening because the six, 700 crores that in 2014 was an export from this country was including the peacekeeping force related spend. And from that, to achieve nearly 11,000 crores in 2020 was a growth of 15 times. This growth primarily came out of the private enterprise and this is essentially where 95% of the exports came to that. In last four years, when the policy didn't exist, how to export and what facilitation government would do, now today we see enormous amount of support from government and that's essentially where I must say the first of what we started exporting as complete weapon system were the naval weapons and the naval weapons were more because there's trust between the uniform and the industry and the uniform made no bones of talking to the colleagues in uniform in other countries which we always see when a president of that country comes in or the defense minister like we saw last week keeps lobbying and talking for major purchases from that country. India has to start getting into some similar kind of a mode and find some new methods. And this is essentially where we today are working with the government to create some of those new processes. And in the DPEPP, the Defense Export and um, uh, Production and Export Promotion uh, Policy, some of these actually are going to be creating a process called something similar to what the Americans call the FMS. We named it Maitri. If I'm friend with you, then you can trust me and buy from my nation, and then my forces and the, my government decide where to take it and give it to you. So wherever there's a track record that exists in the surrounding countries, which we certainly want to give with a differentiated capability, those capabilities can be made happen through a process of Maitri. Now, all these, are work in progress. The group of secretaries today having cleared it and the group of ministers is about to be clearing this policy and it will get implemented. What we see is wherever there's that kind of an relationship that existed, the trust that existed, decades of working together existed, there's absolutely nobody feels delicate in terms of telling. And I can say without any uh, sort of a constraint, it's our CNS who started talking overseas about what my industry can do and what my industry's equipment we have used and our experience about it. I think you can't find a better ambassador for what we produce in India to get into the export volumes. And export volumes will alone give us stability.
to be able to reach for technologies which we today cannot fund out of our own mega markets because of cyclicity of orders and the number of orders, especially with Navy, becoming very far and few. This is essentially where I see a future which would go much larger into former shakes, handshakes, and that's essentially what will take us forward. To be here on the Golden Jubilee uh, seminar, uh, when that's getting conducted and the dockyard having contributed so much to the nation, is truly a privilege. The Golden Jubilee is not going to happen once again. It's the first time. And it's always the last time because there's something else that will happen thereafter. And this is the time which essentially will take us into a new future. Let me wish those who really reached us here in terms of uh, the decision makers of the earlier era, who brought the Navy to this kind of a strength, the armed forces who really created that kind of a situation for industry to get uh, associated, trusted the industry in a very, very large way. I think our relationships, shaking hands, working together, we can achieve things which have not yet been achieved by anybody in the world. And I am absolutely clear in my thinking, we don't need examples to be told what somebody has done. If we have a concept type an idea, which only can come from a uniform, the concepts won't come from someone who does it, because the war is not something which he knows. War is something, and the scenarios of war only comes out of the minds of people who are actually going to be preparing for those situations. And once that is talked about, freely shared, we can create those kind of things in real. On this note, on the Golden Jubilee Seminar, let me wish Naval Dockyards all the best. May your glory keep growing. May you do things which are unmatched, more, far more than what you actually have achieved. But that's essentially where every one of us, the industry included, could keep our heads high and say, Sarno Varuna, Jai Hind. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to have in our midst the chief guest for today, Vice Admiral Biswajit Das Gupta, Flag Officer Commanding in Chief, Eastern Naval Command. May I now request Commander in Chief to deliver the inaugural address. quite a challenge being the last speaker in a session because so much has been said one wonders what more is there to add. Chief of Material, DGNP, former Admiral Superintendent Naval Dockyard Vishakapatnam, Flag Officers Sri J.D. Patil, CMDs of MDL, and HSL, Admiral Uthaya, ASD Vizag, distinguished guests, representatives from the industry, ladies and gentlemen. Let me first congratulate ASD, in fact, all the ASDs that have held this appointment and all hands of Naval Dockyard Vizag on completing 50 years of excellence. Amongst the veteran ASDs who are present here, I remember having called on many of them to seek guidance in my younger days. So it's a great privilege and great pleasure to be in your midst. Dockyard started with very humble beginnings and in the late 80s when the government took a call that it should evolve into a naval dockyard, it happened very quickly and by 1972, we had a full-fledged naval dockyard in Vishakapatnam, which has since delivered quality refits and repairs, and has always remained in step with the state of the art in ship repair. 
I'm sure all those you, of you who have been here in the past will have an opportunity to go around the dockyard and see what are the latest developments, and I guarantee you it's going to make you immensely proud. I would like to extend my compliments to the workforce of over 5,300 workers, both uniformed and civilian, in the Naval Dockyard, who stand united in their single-minded focus of refitting and repairing ships to fully combat-worthy status. Many of you will also be aware of the stellar role that was played by the Naval Dockyard during the COVID-19 pandemic. The support to hospitals in repairs and audits of their oxygen plants, innovative developments of equipments and gadgets which were happily used by civil hospitals stand testimony to their innovative skills and dedication to support the national effort. The drive, resilience, and urge to innovate over five decades has indeed been commendable. The theme of the seminar, Atmanirbhar initiatives relevant to the Indian Navy is not an end in itself, like Mr. Patil has mentioned, and so did COM. It is only a stepping stone to where we want to go next. If we want to create an export-oriented market, especially in defense equipment and technology, we have to be Atmanirbhar first. If we cannot cater to our own requirements, where is the question of exporting? We were always Atmanirbhar in mind and spirit, we started building our warships in the 60s, and I remember in 1972, when INS Nilgiri was delivered to the Indian Navy by Mazagon Dock Limited, my father was the commissioning commandery. And little did I realize at that point in time where we had started off our journey on Atmanirvarta. But ever since then, and till the time we are now on the verge of commissioning our indigenous aircraft carrier. The strides that the country has taken in shipbuilding technology, in ship repair technology, and in weapons and equipment is indeed extraordinary, to say the least. 38 out of 41 ships that are on order are on order on the Indian shipyards. That tells the story by itself. However, there is a long way to go. We still have a large number of systems and equipment that we procure from abroad. There is a fair amount of dependence on foreign OEMs. And it is perhaps the biggest bugbear to the Indian Navy or to any other armed force where you have to rely on somebody else to keep yourself combat worthy. That is not a good situation to be in. And we would like to be in a situation where we do not depend on a single foreign equipment manufacturer to keep our Navy combat ready. There are areas where we need to focus on, to mention a few, marine gas turbines, high-tech weaponry and sensors, satellite communications, unmanned systems, where we need to enhance our capability and reduce our reluctance to reverse engineer. We live in an age of technology denial, if nobody is going to give us technology, we have to find our ways. If that means reverse engineering, so be it. Let's take a leaf out of the Chinese page. There should be no, no shame about it. They have done fantastic work in terms of producing their own equipment wherever they got their design from, it doesn't matter. There are two documents which uh, COM made a brief reference to. The first is the Technological Perspective and Capability Roadmap 2018 to 2030. This seeks to aid industry and MSMEs in planning technology development, partnerships, and production arrangements. And the second one is a document called Swavlamban, which is a roadmap for developing indigenous capability over the next 5, 10, and 15 years. I am told that these two documents are available online, and they are available to the general public, to anybody who wants to read it. I would recommend that those interested must peruse these documents, but documents are not enough. There must be enabling policy and other mechanisms, including very regular interaction with the industry, something that Mr. Patil alluded to throughout 
his address. The Navy has started two initiatives in the recent past. One is not so recent, but we have created a directorate of indigenization, which is looking at every avenue possible to indigenize and reduce our dependence on foreign vendors. And the second one, which is more recent, is called the NTAC, the Navy Technology Acceleration Council, which has identified core groups and given targeted activities for them to develop so that we can leapfrog in technology and not take a, a linear growth. So these are uh, initiatives to foster indigenization and self-reliance. In all this, operational capability has to be maintained. And our research and development establishment must be enabled to create capability in the desired time frame. Otherwise, our defense budgets will enrich foreign coffers instead of being plowed back into our own country. This is a delicate line to be walked because we require operational capability, we require it on time, and we don't have too much time. So if there is a development time frame, it has to be practical, it has to meet the operational needs of the armed forces, otherwise it's of no use. Of late, we have started a lot of offloading of services for various reasons, offloading of work. And there is always a debate going on about what should be offloaded and what should remain core expertise of the Navy. I think this is an opportunity for both the Navy and the industry to develop skills and technology to deliver for the Navy, whether through core expertise in our dockyards or whether we need to develop certain capabilities with the industry. Now, Atma Nirbharta is en encompasses within it the concept of reliability. Atma Nirbharta is self-reliance, and reliance is reliability. So whatever we do has to be reliable. It's not enough to do it in-house. We have to do it in-house, and we have to be reliable in what we do. It is a long-term commitment. A life of a ship is approximately 30 years. So if we want to get into indigenization reliably into an Indian naval platform, your long-term commitment is 30 years. So this is the timeline and horizon focus that we have to keep in mind. The Atmanirbhar model must evolve in a way that harnesses the strengths of both public and private enterprise so that they exist in an environment of cooperation and healthy competition but never in conflict. Because why I say this is we often talk about a level playing field. I really don't know what it means. Because there cannot be a level playing field and a non-level playing field. There cannot be public sector and private sector. These are not binary. Each public sector and each private sector may be small, big. They have their strengths and weaknesses. And therefore, we have to harness the strengths of each private and public sector undertaking and not treat them in a binary um, concept of public and private. We need to see what combination is the best and who is going to do the best job for the Navy at any point in time. I think uh, a little bit of a historical perspective is in order. Like I said, Atma Nirbharta was thought of in the 40s and 50s when we got our independence and we created very large public sector undertakings, including defense public sector undertakings. And I think somewhere down the line, all our public sector undertakings failed to rediscover themselves. And there was a point in time when we became unproductive, when we did not keep pace with technology, we became, our processes became inefficient and we failed to deliver to the standards that are required to keep the country at the front end of technology. Now efficiencies have to be increased. Policies, procedures and processes have to be improved. The public sector undertakings need to be given much more autonomy and 
interference of the government must, must reduce to the extent of policy making and enabling the public sector enterprises to be efficient, to make their processes more efficient. Sometimes we find that a welfare state like India comes into conflict with productivity and efficiency. And this is a balance that needs to be drawn where we need to demand efficiency and yet be sensitive to the political environment. It's quite a tightrope walk as anybody who can run a PSU will be able to vouch for. Also, I think how technology is used is extremely important for leadership of the country. In olden times, when there were Greek kings and philosophers, the Greeks always felt that a philosopher must always be the king. Because a philosopher knew what was good for the general humanity and for the people of the country. But since that was not possible, the Greek philosophers felt that the king must definitely be a philosopher. Because these days we have technologies which are destructive, which are disruptive. Nuclear technology, artificial intelligence, unmanned systems, directed energy weapons, space technology, they can be used in any manner that a human being feels. And people in a position of leadership, if they do not direct the manner in which technology is used, it will be to the destruction of humanity. And therefore, it is very important to have good leadership, to harness technology in a manner that serves humanity and meets the needs of the country and the world. So with these thoughts, I would like to once again wish Naval Dockyard a very bright future as it steps into its 51st year of existence. I would urge Naval Dockyard Vizag to aim high, think big, and always believe that we can. I wish the seminar very fruitful deliberations and may it result in tangible and implementable, implementable takeaways. Only then will it have served its purpose. It has always, it has been said that when all is said and done, there is more that is said than is done. So I hope we do more than we say and the seminar produces tangible takeaways. I hope there are five, six, seven, eight points which we can straight away take for implementation and take indigenization, Navy, and our private and public partners together with us forward as we progress to the 51st year of Naval Dockyard Baisak. Thank you very much. Jay. Thank you, sir. It is indeed heartening to state that our call for papers for the seminar has triggered the thinking caps of a large number of personnel. We have received papers from across the industries, MSMEs, Defense Lab, Shipbuilding PSUs, Cadet Training Academies, Training Schools, and the entire Naval Fraternity. Ladies and gentlemen, a compendium of selected papers has been prepared and is ready for release. Also, an online version of the same will be hosted on Naval Unified Domain. May I request Manan Chi to kindly release the compendium. Thank you, sirs. Now it is time to convey our sincere acknowledgments. May I request Rear Admiral I.B. Uthaya, Admiral Superintendent, to present the seminar memento to Sri J.D. Patil.
I would now request DASD to present the seminar memento to Chief of Material. May I now request DSD to present the seminar memento to Commander in Chief. Thank you, sir. We have put together a kaleidoscope of indigenous industry partners showcasing their experience and expertise in support of naval dockyard repair and manufacturing needs. I would now request the senior dignitaries and ASDs of your to kindly proceed to the Tech Expo venue for inauguration by the Commander-in-Chief. 